Hello, everyone, and welcome back to War and Ling Literature, English 1120 at the University of Ottawa. I'm Tim Wilson. Tonight is our third of four lectures on Henry V. So tonight we want to, I want to talk about the way in which the play presents the question of war as somehow bringing together the nation. And this is a theme we see in the, let's say, the social cohesion brought about uh, by war is something we see historically as well as in, in literature throughout, uh, throughout uh, different periods. So uh, before that, I just want to remind everyone that this Friday, I believe it's uh, March 25th, the uh, essay, uh, research essay is due, uh, assignment number three. So it's a reminder that in the syllabus is the description of the topics there, it's the description of what you need to do. You are required to uh, provide as, as evidence uh, and arguments against which you'll respond three secondary sources, so peer-reviewed articles or book chapters on the play. Uh, and the topics, as I said, are in the in the syllabus. A couple of questions I've had offline that I'll just, that many of you may have as well, that, so I'll reiterate those, is uh, the, about the styles for the citations. Uh, so people wonder sometimes, do I use APA, which is the American Psychological Association? Do I use MLA? Do I use Chicago Manual of Style? So my response to that is use whatever style you're comfortable with or use for, your, um, for the course of your major, as long as it's clear and consistent, okay? Um, in the, in the uh, description in the syllabus, there's a link to the uh, English department style guide, which uses the MLA style for citations, okay? So if you, if you don't know what any of those styles mean and you're going, what's he talking about APA and Chicago manual? If you go to that style guide, it's a very short um, guide for doing citations and other, other um, structural elements of your essay. The other question I sometimes get is, um, how do I indicate which topic uh, <clears throat> I'm, my essay is about? It should be self-evident from the title and from the thesis. And, uh, but if you're worried, you can put it, when you post it on Brightspace, you can put it in the comments section. I re I replied to topic number three, or, or um, you can put in the title page of the, the actual paper. So I hope that's useful. Are there any other questions while we're on the topic of the research essay that, uh, that I didn't just refer to or? No questions at this time? Okay, good. So everybody's pretty much done. They're just wrapping it up, editing, right? Yeah. I know, I know I've been there. I, all the, that editing will be done the night before, I'm afraid. I, I know. Kevin G saying, yeah, everything's going well. The big thumbs up. Okay, so if there are no questions uh, and I don't see any at this point, I'll go to Henry V. So we'll Share as always our PowerPoint here. <clears throat> so as I said, at this, this point, uh, we've talked about a few topics. The first lecture we covered some basic background material uh, as well as looked at the function of the chorus. That was in the first lecture. Then in the... Um, Second lecture, we looked at what I call the skeptical interpretation of the play that rather than seeing the play as a celebration of Henry V's achievements and a celebration of England's achievements in the, the, the Battle of Agincourt, um, the, it's a reading or it's a way of interpreting the play that sees it as a subtle critique of these things, a subtle critique of of patriotism, a subtle critique of, of Henry V as, as conniving and as, as not uh, at all concerned with the, the 
human lives that get lost in the way for him achieving his um, his political um, political goals. <clears throat> so tonight we'll look at this unifying England theme, and then for Wednesday's lecture, we're, we're going to look at the Battle of Agincourt itself historically, as well as the textual considerations, the differences between the folio and the quarto version of the play and what that tells us, and then end off with some conclusions or concluding thoughts on the play. That's that's for the Wednesday lecture. Okay, so the in terms of our presentation of the nation, um, one of the first things we note is that, and, and we get this a lot in Shakespeare, is this sense of, of representing a full register of the community. So we get in the first scene, a, a representation of the clergy. We get the nobles in the second scene and then nobles with the clergy deciding whether or not to go to war with, uh, with France. And then in the next scene, we get uh, what we could call East Cheap, uh, these, these drunks and thieves that hang out in taverns. Um, and their prelude to going to war. Um, so we get the full register of different uh, social classes and orders. And we get in, um, in this scene, act two, scene one, we get uh, this indication of there's potential strife in the community. We've got Bardolph uh, having to get in the middle of Nim and, and Pistol who are, um, who are in the middle of about to, they're about to pull out their swords and have a, have a, a fight over, uh, over various things, but over, over a woman, of, of course, uh, because uh, that's the nature of these, uh, these characters. And Bardolph says, why the devil should we keep knives to cut one another's throats? So the, the implication is there, why are we turning on one another when we've got these enemies, these foreign enemies to, to deal with. And this is one of the things we see, let's say, in the social cohesion aspect of war um, throughout the ages. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, Emil Durkheim, you know, 100 years ago, did a study um, and found that nations that during war for, for that nation, suicide rates are much lower than other, than other nations. So um, <clears throat> the, uh, there's the sense that there's a common purpose and meaning given to their lives during the war that they might not otherwise have. And Melody's in the chat, there's make sure everyone saw that as a witty remark about especially more conniving, oh, okay, good, with a pun on knife, I guess, and knives. Uh, but I'm dumb, yeah, good one. And, uh, so thank you. Yeah, that's good. I should have missed that obvious pun. So um, the Bardolph will echo this notion that um, we have to put away the knives that we have on each other's throats so that we can stand united to this common enemy. Okay. Um, and it's interesting to think about that in today's context. You know, we live in an age that is deeply polarized for, let's say, a number of reasons. Uh, but uh, you know, I think a case could be made for various access access to polyvalent uh, communities of information, whereas in previous ages, maybe people had access to uh, kind of a, a, a monotony of of information from a few sources and. Now people, let's say, uh, aggregate around, as I said, these communities of information exacerbated by social media, et cetera. So could war or, or that type of thing, definitely a, a pandemic wasn't enough. Could uh, those types of things bring together uh, in the sense of social cohesion, a, uh, a community? Um, it's difficult to say whether or not that's the case today. So in this play, the one of the ways in which the uh, 
the different groups are represented is, is we have different linguistic groups. So it's of the plays, it's very, one of the, let's say the linguistic differences really strike the reader, I would say. So we'll talk a little bit about, I think it's act three, scene four, what we could call the language lesson where we have a whole scene that's in French, which is exceedingly rare. I can't think of any other play that has a whole scene in another language. Um, so, so there's that element, the French, but even with on the English side, we have different accents and flavors. We've got the Welsh, we've got Irish, we've got Scottish, um, all being represented alongside these, these English soldiers. And we need to unite these, uh, the play seems to say these, these different factions, these different linguistic groups, these different social classes uh, through foreign war uh, as, uh, and this Henry's father, Henry V's father, Henry IV, had expressed it rather neatly in the, the previous play, the second part of Henry IV. Um, he sought to go on a crusade, so a, kind of a foreign military expedition, in his words, to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. And, and his goal in doing so was to solidify his shaky regime. Is Henry V continuing that? Is he learning from his father and saying, okay, yeah, this is a good idea. We need to go to war with in France to do the same. I've got, I've got, let's say, a, a, a realm that is divided linguistically, divided in terms of loyalties between church and their and their state and, and these types of things. Will I be able to bring the community together and solidify my control of this regime by, by a foreign um, military campaign? Similar sentiment in Act 4, Scene 1. This is when Henry is in disguise and going among the troops. Uh, one of the troops that uh, he encounters there, Bates chastises, chastises Williams and Henry. Henry and Williams had been getting into a debate there. As they argue, he says, be friends, you English fools. We have French quarrels enough if you could tell how to reckon. <clears throat> and uh, on this, notion of using the war as a way to bring together the nation. I'll just well, think we'll go through, let's say line by line, this, this speech, it's a famous speech um, from, from act three, scene one. In fact, it, the speech, this speech constitutes the whole scene. It's, uh, it's Henry rousing the troops for another wave of assault on, on her floor. Okay, so in uh, the previous um, the previous lecture on the on the skeptical interpretation, we had looked at this his speech to to the men of Harfleur to Harfleur itself, threatening them to to lay down their defenses or else all manner of hell would be brought upon them, and we we looked at that as as one potential way to interpret that as part of that skeptical interpretation, i.e., we see we see Henry willing to do or at least threaten all manner of evil for, for his military and political ends. Here, this is taking place before that. It's taking place a, a couple of scenes before that um, in act three, scene one. <clears throat> He's trying to rally the troops for a charge. So a couple of things to note. The fact that in act three, scene three, we, get, we then get a speech to the governor and the men of Harfleur to please surrender, don't make us do all manner of evil means that this charge that he roused the troops up, even though it may sound uh, sound very uh, encouraging, it sounds it's a very let's say inspiring speech, um, especially if done by a great Shakespearean actor. Um, that it was ineffective. This 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 speech did not manage to it maybe it roused the troops, but the actual charge was ineffective. So this speech, it rouses the troops, but it also calls on all of the, the classes and all the orders of the society to work together as one. So that's why I wanted to look at it, look at it under this theme of, of the war as unifying England. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. 
stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage, then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth a gallad rock or hang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. So that first part is, is all about, um, well, first more, once more to the breach, we've got to charge again. And the argument is about how in doing so, put on a mask of courage. It's so in a way, again, to the, let's say the skeptical interpretation, someone who's, let's say an advocate of that skeptical interpretation would say for Harry is, thinks about everything as a mask, as something uh, that one can wear. So we don't get a, a sense that there is necessarily a genuine notion of virtue at hand here. Um, here he's just saying, you know, there are there are virtues in peace, but here wear the mask of a brave soldier now. And he even gives very detailed instructions on what to do with your face, how to how to scrunch your eyes so you look brave, maybe kind of like uh, Clint Eastwood in those old Clint Eastwood westerns there, and and you're going to look more fearful. Um, the second part is addressed to the nobles of of the English. So there's we'll look at three parts to this speech. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fet from fathers of war proof, fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought, and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood, and teach them how to war. So this is addressed to, let's say, the noble, the nobles among his troops, and um, appeals to their sense of of their nobility and the nobility of their blood. So it appeals to their line. It says, you know, show that you are children of your fathers, you know, show that your, your mothers were not unfaithful to those fathers, like by, by being like your father and be a copy, be a, be a, let's say a model for others who are not as, as descended from such a, a noble line. Here, nobility is, they're nobles because they come from a, lo a line of warrior aristocrats. So remember, there's that, that sense too in the Iliad of the warrior aristocrats, duty to the community, but also the fact that they are, they are aristocrats because of what they've demonstrated in war. <clears throat> now this third part's addressed to the yeomen, which are, which are let's say kind of a, a, a middling class, but uh, between the, the, the arist aristocracy and kind of the lowest, the lowest peasant farmers, they, uh, they likely own land at some, uh, in some way. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start, the games afoot. Follow your spirit upon this charge. Cry, God for Harry, England and St. George. Um, so we have a comment on the kind of the, I, I think in relation to, um, in relation to the kind of put on a mask of courage, fake it till you make it reminds me of when Macbeth's wife tells him to be brave before the murder and also her monologue when she calls for her kindness to be stripped off from very good. Yes, those are good. Uh, the, the Macbeth, uh, the Macbeth comparison is a good one. Um, uh, there's there are a number of those in Shakespeare. Uh, um, Portia, the wife of Brutus and Julius Caesar, very similar in terms of in in both the the cases of both Lady Macbeth and Portia, it's a question of their gender as something that they can strip off and become men and become capable or men or at least in the sense of a gendered notion of of a socially constructed notion of what it takes to be able to do these kind of deeds. 
So very good. <clears throat> um, so, so the first point in the, is in that first, the first part of that speech about, you know, when there's a virtue for peace, but when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. So he's exhorting them to become like Homeric hero, heroes, right? He's, he's, and remember how we're in a different context, right? We're in a context where Christianity has for, for 1500 years, let's say softened that heroic ethos to some extent, and he needs to call on it again. So he understands there's a virtue for peace and a virtue for war. Um, unlike Coriolanus, another Shakespeare play, a, a, one of his Roman plays, Coriolanus didn't understand the difference. And this is what is, is the tragedy of Coriolanus. He's what the city needs during war. He's probably the, the prototypical Shakespearean warrior, a, no greater warrior in Shakespeare. Um, but in, in peace, he couldn't understand that a different virtue of, let's say, sociability and, and a willingness to, to demonstrate peaceable virtues is, is also required. And then I also noted here that Richard III, for those of you who've read Richard III, uh, Richard III, another English history play, but about this, this great tyrant, Richard III, um, is, is, let's say, the, the greatest tyrants of any of, of Shakespeare's plays. And um, Richard III, at the, right at the beginning, um, laments the fact that peace has broken out because for him, it's in war, not in peace, that, that he's a person such as himself is able to thrive. Um, so <clears throat> I'll just point out too that this speech, it's a rousing speech, as I said, you know, do, do try to listen to. Uh, Lawrence Olivier give it or give this speech or or Kenneth Branagh you know check out YouTube for those um, uh, much better than my reading but we can get sucked up in the rhetoric but in the next scene we kind of get this let us say a parodic or kind of ironic juxtaposition so the it opens with Bardolph so one of these kind of lower characters from East Jeep that I was describing earlier on, 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 on to the breach, to the breach. So the, uh, you know, once more to the breach, dear friends, hasn't really inspired them. Bardolph has to still get his his men up to the to the breach, and it's it's a juxtaposition with with Henry's speech in a couple of ways. You know, we've got the noble, this noble uh, with a speech that's full of of poetry and and. And then it's a juxtaposed with this, that is the common characters that are speaking prosaically. Um, so there, there's scenes of contrast, but in some ways they're also scenes of identity. They, uh, they show a common concern from two perspectives. So there's a couple of ways of taking it. Um, so some, some people look at these juxtapos juxtapositions that, that Shakespeare puts in these plays, you know, a juxtaposition between, let's say, aristocracy and, and poetic language and, and um, common people and, and prosaic language and say Shakespeare was a snob and, and didn't like the fickle rabble and was, was juxtaposing them as a way of showing how feeble the fickle rabble were. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think it shows that there's a common concern. This is the Battle of Agincourt, but that it can arise in slightly different perspectives um, and, and that they're all united by this, this cause and, and that Henry wouldn't be able to, to take this without the common people. He would, who's, who's gonna, once more to the breach, who's doing this once more to the breaching? You know, if I were, if I were able to say that. It's it's this this common band of troops. It's not it's not him and Exeter and, and Westmoreland. Uh, but but we do see in this in this scene we do see cowardice among this among this group. So so once more to the breach, you know uh, you know stir up your you know screw your face into this warrior aspect. But what we see with the troops is that 
is is that they're afraid and they and they they don't necessarily buy it. They don't buy the rhetoric of this speech. Um, this is you know as I say here on the slide, maybe this is the reality of war that Henry's rhetoric is trying to poetically paper over. Um, and when Bardolph tries to rally them and he's saying on, on, on to the breach, you know, uh, don't, uh, you're, this is your chance for honor. They, they eschew this, this claim to honor. Uh, they, they would rather live this, this, what they're guided by a desire to, to continue to exist more than risk their lives for the sake of honor. The boy says, I would give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. So this is a direct dismissal, let's say, of the heroic ethos. Um, the, so I, yeah, I think I've made this point, like that the skeptical reading could point to an identity in these actions. You know, uh, I think another way of looking at the skeptical reading would be to say, okay, well, these common characters are just there for stealing they're not there for the honor. They're not there for uh, some sort of divine, divinely inspired uh, mission for the nation. They're just there to steal, right? For for illegal means. Um, but a, a skeptical interpretation could say, well, is this in any sense uh, essentially different from what Henry V himself is doing in terms of trying to steal and 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 loot France, so to speak. So as I mentioned, there's this uh, scene, act three, scene four, uh, which all in French, uh, which is uh, extremely, extremely rare. I, I, I don't know of any other scene that's in another language. Even uh, as I know here, kind of one of our earliest forms of drama, Aeschylus, uh, uh, ancient Greek tragedian, had a play called The Persians, which had a lot of Persians on stage the, interacting in supposedly Persian, but they were speaking Greek in those, in those plays. So, so um, but Shakespeare goes all the way and says, no, let's show them speaking French. Um, and it works because they can point to body parts. They can say, you know, what's the word for this? What's the word for that? What's this word? So the audience kind of follows along. They know that they're translating different words in um, uh, from French, they know what the French word, even if they don't speak French, they can probably piece it together that they're, that they're saying, you know, uh, uh, may, uh, you know, okay, they're pointing to the hand there. So they must be saying hand. And then we get confirmation of that when um, comedically they try in a very French accent, try to say hand in, in, in English. So there is a certain commonality, a certain universality at the level of our, corpor our corporeal bodies. That seems to be one message there. You know, we can, trans we can transcend different cultural barriers because of a certain shared, just physical, uh, physical attributes that we share. That's a very, let's say, it's a realistic, but not a very noble sentiment about what unites all humans. It's, uh, are we united in the sense that we all strive for the highest ideals or in this Christian context that we are all, if, if you know, Shakespeare were a, a devout Christian author would, and this were a treatise on Christianity, uh, would, he, would he not say something that we're all united in being children of, of, of Christ, that we're all, all, all need to, to find sales, salvation through Christ, these types of things. Here, no, the only uniting factor across these moral sensibilities, let us say, is, is kind of pointing to body parts. And it kind of points to the same challenges among the different nationalities within England and the different languages that need to be bridged there. Um, you also note that in this scene, Act 3, Scene 4, uh, the easy pointing breaks down when it gets to naming taboos. So the gown and foot end up in, uh, in the translations to English as gown and foot sound like four letter words in French and there's giggling and stuff like that. But the, and it, it's, it's an opportunity for humor, but it shows where that, that simple, let's say 
commensurability, our ability to speak across languages and cultural divides, breaks down a bit when it comes to social taboos. <clears throat> so uh, Shakespeare makes an effort, I would say, to have all four nationalities present, including Scottish troops, which was ahistorical. Scotland was allied with the French in, the, in this particular battle, right? So he's got McMorris representing the Irish, he's got Jamie uh, representing the Scottish and Flewellyn, or sometimes changed to Llewellyn representing the Welsh. And there's comic plays on, on different linguistic accents that they these three use on their, their, their different temperaments. Um, and I'll just note too that this one of the sources for the play is um, uh, for, for Henry V, the other, the other drama that tried to dramatize the, these incidents was um, for them, it was the French that was, that was the multicultural, let's say um, uh, army. So it was them that brought together these different nationalities. So, so Shakespeare, for some reason, and I think it has to do with this notion of can war bring together the nation? Um, so Shakespeare uh, uses, uh, goes out of his way to let's say reverse what happened historically and what happens in the sources that he used in order to make this point about, about war unifying the nation. And just for those who, who um, just try to highlight what we're talking about here, you know, we obviously, these are the, the British Isles uh, um, and we, we have the, the Irish uh, contingent here from this, from this uh, island of Ireland and then the Scottish contingent here um, and the English from, the, from, uh, from this, this region and the Welsh primarily from here. Um, and he's reflecting real divisions in the nation at the time. So Scotland is still very independent of England at this time. As, as I mentioned, they were allied with the French at that time. It's not as though they were at all under one government, under one United Kingdom as they are now. And obviously Scotland is, uh, is, is, is uh, there, there are movements lo looking for Scottish independence of, of the United Kingdom to this day, but uh, at least for now, it is, it is part of a United Kingdom, but this wasn't the case in the 16th century. Henry the uh, Richmond, who was to become Henry the Seventh, was Welsh and incorporated Wales into, in, into England, but at that time there was still a division. And Ireland is still, uh, was still at this time very much independent and Shakespeare's play was written in the context of, and there's an allusion to this in the chorus of the fifth act. There's an allusion to ex Essex's military expedition in Ireland. So, so none of these regions was necessarily just gonna play ball at this point in, in history with an English monarch's uh, foreign wars. It's, it can't be assumed. So what, what we could see here is a potential critique, uh, an early critique of the English imperial project. Um, Henry V uh, wants to incorporate France into the kingdom, but he can't even incorporate Wales, Scotland and Ireland, right? So he, and this, this problem becomes exacerbated even more so during English, uh, um, imperial endeavors even beyond Shakespeare's day. It, we have kind of before, you know, very early critique by Shakespeare of the imperial project of his own nation potentially here. Now I wanna look at this band of brothers speech um, or uh, sometimes referred to as the Crispin's day. <clears throat> just as the other one had three parts, this one also has three parts. And we want to look at it for the same reason. Henry's rhetoric here is deployed with the goal of showing that everyone in this disparate army is are a band of brothers, are, are together, so to speak. So the context is... Um, he, Henry comes along, he enters the scene kind of in the middle, and 
and he had just overhears Westmoreland, these other nobles, talking about the numbers. So they're talking about how there's how there's over ten thousand French, and very few few English. Uh, I forget the exact number. Um, and Westmoreland says, I, "I wish we had some more of the men that we left behind in England." And uh, Henry is just entering at that point and, and begins his speech in this way. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one more, man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear, such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No faith, cuz, wish not a man from England. God's peace, I wish I would not lose so great an honor as one man more, methinks, would share from me. For the best hope I have, oh, do not wish one more. So this first part is, is basically making this case, you know, don't wish for any more people um, or it will cut into our share of honor and pay attention to this notion of honor here. Uh, remember, we talked about the, the notion of honor in Homer um, and we have a return to that or an appeal to that notion of honor, that it's a it's a limited substance that if there's more people, we're gonna to have to divide it up and our share will be lower. Um, and well, it, it's interesting that he, he appeals here by, by Jove, you know, uh, it's not unheard of uh, in Shakespeare to have these references, but it is telling that um, he's referring to a, a pagan God there in his appeal to this kind of ancient pagan uh, heroic ethos. So the second part of the speech uh, is is really about, um, so we already said, don't wish for any more. Ra and the second part is about, let's get rid of the ones that we have that are not, uh, that, that are afraid to fight and keep only the ones that with bravery and with honor. Rather proclaim it Westmoreland through my host that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Um, interest, so here, a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> so obviously he's making this point about, we can get rid of those who are not ready to die with us. We'll keep the ones that want to, and they'll, they'll maybe you know, get scars and they'll live into old age and proudly show those scars. We see a reference later at um, the end of act four, Four, uh, to, to Pistol, uh, he's lost all of his comrades and um, his parting words are about how he's gonna return to England. He's got scars from fighting other English people, uh, but he's gonna pretend uh, and it, it's, it's not to, to, in the sense that, that Henry's talking about here, but he's gonna say he got them fighting the French uh, at Agincourt. So we have a kind of, let's say, an ironic undercutting of the sentiment expressed here. And then the third part of this speech is about how the, their names will be immortal. They, they will live on till the end of time because of their feats here. Then shall our names familiar, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son and Crispin Crispian shall never go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me 
shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. So the, again, the, there's a, it's a band of brothers, so this, the social classes are being, let's say, dispensed with, and what unites them is having fought in this battle. So you, those who are not born gentle, this day shall gentle their condition. So they will become gentlemen, they will become nobles in a manner of speaking because of their feats here. And the quote unquote real gentlemen, the real aristocrats back in England who are sleeping and who didn't come with them will consider themselves less than, um, than these people who are, are here right now. So it's a kind of a reversal of those social roles that, uh, that his listeners would, would find themselves in. So uh, I'll just reiterate that this, the speech is about instilling in them this, again, this desire for honor, this Homeric desire for honor. And the, it's akin to the classical notion of kleos, where it's not an infinite supply. Um, we are a happy few. Uh, we few, we happy few, we brand of brothers. We're a happy few because we're going to share alone in the honor and glory. We're going to share among a very few, few people the honor and glory. Um, very different from, let's say, the Christian, again, the Christian notion of, uh, of honor as uh, an interior well of the soul that is not from external recognition of feats. So I want to turn now to Act 3, Scene 7, where we have these, as I say here, these sonnets to horses. Um, uh, so it's a, an, another parody of the French, so to speak. Uh, they're, um, uh, and they're exaggerated examples of what we would see in a medieval world of chivalry. So they're exaggerated examples of what we would see in medieval literature about medieval chivalric knights. Um, and it opens with the constable saying, tut, I have the best armor of the world. And then Orleans replies, or Orléans replies, but let my horse have his due. So it begins quick with them exchanging kind of self-praise about their armor, about their horses, and about how great they, these, these attributes of them are. And, and Bourbon declares, I once read a sonnet to in his praise. So they, they, this, we have, I guess, uh, quite legitimately, this French noble uh, nobleman who's declared that they are writing sonnets. Remember, they, like, we didn't read any of Shakespeare's love sonnets, but normally, you know, these love sonnets are written to unattainable ladies of of the court, and it's an attempt to show one's devotion to this to this uh, female love object, and that's the conventions of these love poetry. But here, it's directed towards a horse. Um, so a couple of things there. These are knights. Uh, the, these are all knights in shining armor, but they're these knights in shining armor are never to really to after Agincourt. There's never to be another battle where knights in shining armor are are dominating the battlefield. Agincourt marks the end of this as a mode of of battlefield excellence, and the French are shown to be completely out of touch in this scene, right? They're, they're, they're praising their armor, which is ineffective against the English longbows, their horses, which were ineffective in the, in, in the, in the actual battle. Um, and they're out of touch with the changes in tactics, but also the, all of those cultural references as well. They're, they're out of touch with where love poetry has gone. We're out of touch with, uh, with, um, the fact that the English are in touch with the common people, and this is just a tribe of nobles only. They have not made a shift to a modern regime, a, mod a modern cultural regime, or a modern military regime. The other thing, I, as I note here on the slide, is, um, is I, I would say this is, uh, I haven't seen a lot of scholarly discussion of this. Uh, I haven't seen any scholarly discussion of this, but to me, it's an obviously a reference to um, 
the beginning of, of Sidney's defense of poetry. So defense of a famous work that it was written uh, about a decade before this one, but Shakespeare definitely knew it, uh, opens with um, Sidney talking about this, um, this uh, gentleman he had stayed with in Italy who was praising horsemanship. And he says, I had, he had praised it so highly, I wish I, had, I would become a horse. So it begins with this ironic, excessive praising of horses and horsemanship. So we have it exa that exact kind of conduct happening here, except it's not ironic. It's these French characters are actually excessively praising horsemanship and horses. <clears throat> um, so as I quickly noted, we don't see common soldiers when we see the French scenes. We don't see uh, the common people at all. We only see the nobles. Um, whereas Henry speaks to the whole regime. He, for, for, for Shakespeare, for Henry V, the, what makes England unique, what makes it a successful regime is that it, it it harnesses the power, power of the whole regime as one. So Henry V, in a way, has a, a, has a type of citizen army that's very successful and is, is almost modeled on the Roman citizen army. And for this reason, Llewellyn uh, is pleased with it as it's in line with the, the Roman, quote unquote, disciplines of the wars. Uh, and the, the, the French are fighting for personal honor. They're, they're, they're praising their own horse, their own armor. Um, Henry's appeal is, is to individuals, how they'll look back on it, but they'll look back on it as a band of brothers, as a band of equals that, that are sharing in that honor. It's a, it's a subtle distinction. Um, so in the, this, uh, one of the last scenes I want to look at here in this lecture is, uh, act four, scene one. So this is Henry's moving among the troops in disguise. Um, now, it's, Henry's there with the troops. Now, for those of you who've read uh, Antony and Cleopatra, we have the opposite at, 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 at um, play out. We have this, uh, this lieutenant, uh, this, uh, this one of the, the leaders under Antony Ventidius uh, underscores the problem of winning via lieutenant. So in Antony and Cleopatra, we have this huge Roman empire and we have um, Octavius with his troops and his lieutenants and, and we have Antony with his troops and his lieutenants trying to manage a large sections of this huge empire. And um, here we have Henry leading the troops directly in battle. Uh, so Ventidius says in Antony and Cleopatra, Caesar and Antony have ever won more in their officer than their person. Now, um, so Ventidius, what, what that leads to is, is Ventidius knows that he, he's, there's no incentive for him to, let's say, outdo himself. There's no, there's no incentive for him to try to uh, take on further objectives than the one he was given, because if the risk of, of, of a further advancement leads to, to glory, that could be seen as uh, by, by his superior as, as somehow steering the glory from him, and that could get a, um, uh, a reaction, or even if he does, the, the glory will go to, 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 to Antony, and then if he fails, all the accountability goes to him, right? So he gets he gets none of the glory, but all the accountability. Um, Henry, on the other hand, will lead directly in battle. So even more, he, he wants to he wants to be close to them and know the people. Okay. Um, and the other the, the other thing we could note here is that um, in terms of the the value of the common people in this play, they're given names. So in this. This scene, Act Four, Scene One, Bates, Williams, I'm forgetting the third character's name, but we get to know their names, their people with their, their characters, with, with, with lives, so to speak. In Julius Caesar, a, a kind of our uh, comparator, when we see the common people, they're just in the play, in the script of the play, it's Plebeian One and Plebeian Two. You know, they're not given any individual identity. 
And again, you know, as I said, it's presented in contrast to the French. We don't see the French king. We don't see the Dauphin. We don't see any of those nobles that we saw in, in Act 3, Scene 7. None of them are, are, are mingling with the common soldiers, so to speak. Um, the other thing to note is, is Henry feels he has to go in disguise in order to learn the truth. So he knows that monarchs are flattered and, and will not get the truth. And this is... Um, this is true, let's say, in all walks of life, too. You know, like the, the higher you get into, let's say, a, a, a private sector organization or government with, with many, many uh, people in the organization, when, you're be, you, when you begin among them, you know all the gossip and everything like that. And what I've noticed just in my own career and with others that I've seen, you know, as they become uh, the head of these large organizations, they don't know the gossip of who's not doing pulling their weight or who's doing this or or who, who's secretly got a crush on this other coworker, you know, all that in, at, in office politics. Um, the, to learn the truth, and this a wise leader, uh, Henry being a wise leader knows this, he knows he can't get the truth unless he goes in disguise and becomes one of them. If he goes as a leader, they'll only tell him what they think he wants to hear. Um, and uh, Henry says, you know, uh, the, the king, uh, is but a man as I am, which is highly ironic, ironic because he, he, the, he is the king, right? Uh, but he's saying this in disguise as Harry Le Roy. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing we can see here is, is um, this scene as a, also leading to what we've called the skeptical interpretation of the play, because as he goes among these people, as he as he goes in disguise, um, he's led into this debate with Williams. I won't get into it, and I won't read the the speech I've quoted here that that Henry says afterwards. But I refer you to it. But so look at this scene where he gets into this debate with Williams over the responsibility of the king. So Williams is saying it's. Uh, any deaths, if they're bad deaths, you know, in this battle to come, if they're not just, it's the responsibility of the king. And it, it brings up the question that the play, that Henry wants to avoid, but the play can't, is, is about whether this war is just. And the, the question was raised, as I note here, at the beginning with that convoluted speech on the Salic law. And it returns here towards the end, and, and the play doesn't come down with a very clear answer either way. Um, but uh, it, it shows that the play cannot avoid it, although Henry wants to avoid it. Henry wants to avoid the responsibility. So in the speech I've cited here, he laments that he, he can't sleep like these, other, um, like these other common soldiers because they, he feels that they can sleep with a clear conscience, but he has all the weights of governing on his shoulders. And um, what this forgets is that he had just had this encounter with these troops in the middle of the night. They can't sleep either. You know, they don't have the weight of governing on their shoulders. They have the, the weight of their lives on their shoulders. They could die. And what's their family? What, how are their family going to be provided for? How, what, what, what's what's going to happen now with, well, to their own souls, let us say. Um, and in the speech, he also, in this speech, uh, 239 to 57 or so, he also, it creates a certain distance between himself and the wretched slaves that he talks about, which goes against this whole band of brothers rhetoric uh, that he had cultivated in the other speeches. This speech, 41239, I think that line citation is wrong. Like he, it's his soliloquy towards the end of that speech. And it, I think it goes on further than that, but it's, it's him alone. And maybe do we get Henry's real thoughts there? To, um, and, and maybe some flawed thinking, as I said, flawed thinking in the sense that he's looking over the fact that the, the, the common soldiers can't sleep just as he can't sleep. So he's, he's giving them uh, a peacefulness that they're not enjoying. And in the speech, he's creating a certain distance between himself and the wretched slave, which belies the rhetoric, the public rhetoric he had given earlier about being a band of brothers. So I'm going to end there and um, 
uh, as I said, uh, this was uh, our, our third of four lectures on Henry V. The, the Wednesday one will close off with some conclusions uh, on, the, on the play. And then for Friday, we have our assignments due. So looking forward to reading those. Okay, everyone have a great week. Oh, we have a question. Sydney. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. I just have a quick question. It's more about formatting for the essay. Sure, that's great. Um, yeah, others probably have that as well. Yeah, that's why I was just going to ask it um, in class. But are we allowed to uh, include more than three uh, like outside references? Very good question. Yeah, you, you're welcome to include more than three. Uh, don't don't get weight, too weighted down with it, I would say, because you don't have a lot of space to incorporate them. But if you can, uh, different strategies for incorporating different ones that you've come across that maybe you don't want to, let's say, paraphrase the whole argument, but you, you lump that other article in as part of the citation as another scholar that supports the same basic point on the play or that section of the play. But all that to say, yes, uh, you can refer to more than three. Okay, thank you. And my second uh, short question is, do you have any um, sources or websites on how to cite Shakespeare? Because I know it's pretty tricky sometimes. Yeah, I, I check the, um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I should have provided some examples, but I think, you know, the English department style guide I referred to at the beginning of the class, but maybe, maybe you just joined in or missed it. But the English department style guide, I'm pretty sure has examples of that. Also in the, the actual slides, the actual slides when I've been doing it, you know, when I've looked at a speech, you know, I've just in parentheses, I've been doing, I've been doing examples of those citations, right? So, so act period, scene period, and then the line numbers is basic, basic way of citing in, in, in the text in terms of citing the lines and then the same structure of, of citing any text if you, when putting it into the work cited or bibliography at the end. I hope that helps. Yep, that's good. Thank you so much. Any other comments or questions on the, uh, the assignment or any other matters? Okay, that's great. Uh, as I said, have a great week, everyone. Oh, there is a question. Oh, wait. In the chat. So here's Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, go I, ahead. Hi there. I put my question in the in the uh, chat. It's about um, uh, if we could use like peer reviewed or scholarly books and stuff. Because I know you kept saying articles and everything else. I was wondering if books are uh, fine to use as well. Right. Yeah. So a book chapter or a book. Yeah, that's fine. That's a good question. Very good question. Perfect. Thank you. Have a great day. You too, Kevin. Going once. Going twice. Sold. Have a great week, everyone.